I understand that I'm far from the first person to try and critically analyze the music genre of Vaporwave that seems to so easily escape everyone's grasp as soon as they attempt to get hold. One standout video that attempts to do this, and also inspired me to make this one, is Pat Chennington's Vaporwave and 9-11, A Nostalgic Connection, in which he makes vague connections between 9-11 and its ripple effects in American culture that ended up influencing the genre. Other critics claim that Vaporwave critiques aspects of millennial nostalgia as it parodies its hyper-consumerist aspects, but let's not get ahead of ourselves here. First, we need to break down what Vaporwave is. Starting with the name, Vaporwave is most likely a reference to the term vaporware, which refers to the practice of announcing computer hardware or software that makes flashy claims and either comes out late or flat out vaporizes from existence. The word vaporware was notably used to refer to Microsoft's late release of their first version of Windows in 1985. In fact, the very term vaporware was coined by a Microsoft engineer. So it's no surprise that the aesthetic of old Microsoft operating systems, such as Windows 95 and 98, are so common in the core aesthetic of Vaporwave. This Vaporware generation of tech, in the late 90s and early 2000s specifically, made many big promises and grandiose claims about how quickly it would improve. Moore's Law is a good example of this. Alongside big hardware claims, there were also promises of Web 1.0 ushering in a new era of social computing, a place where the individual had total freedom, could make wonderful things, and expand their consciousness with technology in a way that made socializing the old way feel as obsolete as sending a physical letter when you already have email. We embodied this kind of promise with chat apps like IRC and AIM, old school online games like Quake and RuneScape, YouTube series like Is It A Good Idea To Microwave This, and online forums before the birth of Reddit. This transitional period in technology, this in-between time, eventually took us from decades and years having distinct, memorable, nostalgic personalities into what we are stuck with in the modern era, the forever now. The internet slowly went from being something made by individuals for individuals to something corporate and monetized. We went from lighthearted, fun shows that people filmed at home for YouTube to the constant daily corporate drone of mass-produced content. The promise of the early days of the internet was lost. It too, like many others made during that time, vaporized. What the internet was before mass corporatization eventually became vaporware itself. This forever now culture shapes how the new generation thinks about, feels, and perceives time. The forever now is not about generating new culture. It's about recycling old culture or borrowing it from anything even remotely indie so it can be immediately monetized. This exact phenomena of vaporware promises and corporate monetization is a big part of Vaporwave's allure as it tries to remedy the consequences of these things that so greatly fatigue the specific generations of people who listen to the genre. Vaporwave is a relatively new genre, and just like any other, it's a product of its core listening base. For example, punk and grunge were influenced, and still are, by youth political counterculture and anarchist thought. And this effect is similar in the case of Vaporwave's relation with people who are part of Gen Z, or as Pew Research defines it more clearly, someone born after the year 1997. The generation of listeners is particularly important in regards to Vaporwave as a genre, as it's a representation of the way that Gen Z interfaces with the metaphysical concept of nostalgia. Nostalgia is something most generations of people find savory and tend to partake in from time to time. Meanwhile, Gen Z considers this more of a necessity as their experience growing up is uniquely peppered with many traumatic once-in-a-lifetime economic crashes, global pandemics, weather catastrophes, and political events. This makes Gen Zers more likely to reach for some kind of previous time to regress to as a way to cope with these realities. Regressing is a way to find emotional safety by either thinking of a time in the world before these problems existed, or an earlier age in one's life where they didn't yet grasp the totality of the various stressors of heavy-handed responsibility and late-stage capitalism. The pop song Stressed Out by 21 Pilots comes to mind when talking about this sort of thing, as its lyrics describe the way in which people think back to their simple childhood when the stress of constantly needing to be profitable pains them so much in their adult lives. Now, the problem today's youth run into when reaching for this regression mechanism is that it's not very fleshed out, since many Gen Zers are not yet old enough to have a plethora of nostalgic memories, and some of them from recent past are fuzzy or incomplete. These two words are a very good example of the general feeling of most Vaporwave music, fuzzy and incomplete. But to dive into this, it's worth mentioning how Vaporwave started. Many would point to Daniel LePayton under the temporary pseudonym Chuck Person and his album Chuck Person's Eco Jams Volume 1 as being the birth of Vaporwave. This proto-Vaporwave is nowadays considered under the genre Plunder Phonics because, at its core, its tracks are chopped and screwed samples of already popular copyrighted songs, thus the name Plunder Phonics. In fact, the genre as a whole has sparked debates over copyright law and what defines the fine line between infringement and fair use. Many of the tracks in this album certainly step right on that line, as they can be easily recognized despite the distortions added to create their plunder counterparts on the album. 
A website for tracking music sampling, whosample.com, notes that track B3 from the album samples Baker Street by Jerry Rafferty, and track B7, yes, these are the actual song names, samples Woman in Chains by Tears for Fears. This technique of sampling popular songs also reflects in the most acclaimed vaporwave album of all time, Floral Shop by Ramona Xavier, under the pseudonym Macintosh Plus. Its headliner track, translated from Japanese as Lisa Frank 420 Modern Computer, samples the pop song It's Your Move by Diana Ross. This song, while following the technique that Daniel LePayton used to make eco jams, refines it by being less aggressive with the chopping of samples and simultaneously choosing only to slow down vocal samples instead of periodically speeding them up like Daniel did. This specific artistic choice was important for the future of Vaporwave since these unnatural sounding, slowed vocal samples became a staple of the genre. These two albums set the stage for what we can consider as a relatively well-made or poorly made Vaporwave track, in which Eco Jams and Floral Shop lie in the middle ground. Samples are processed by the artist and are chopped and screwed in a particular rhythmic pattern. On the admittedly more lazy side of Vaporwave, we have music that begins to fall more so in the category of edits or decor. These are Vaporwave songs where the sample is usually used in full, and the only intervention from the artist is the slowing of the track with some level of reverb added to imply the sound of a Vaporwave song. Basically, if the middle ground is cherry soda, then this low ground is cherry-flavored seltzer water. You get a faint taste of what it's trying to be, and while some people don't mind the taste, it leaves many others longing for what the full experience is. Going on the complete opposite side of this spectrum, we have High Effort Vaporwave. This is when the artist goes out of their way in terms of production by using esoteric audio samples collected from sources such as television broadcasts or malls that are either hard to find or personally recorded by the artist. In the case of the artist Desert Sand Feels Warm at Night, all vocal samples used in their music are their own, which works in stark contrast to similar songs in the genre that usually rip such vocal samples from Japanese vinyl music or old American pop music. If you ever have the time to listen to Desert Sand Feels Warm at Night, their vocals are impressive, and their musical composition envelops you in a soft oral blanket that you just want to get cozy in. Anyways, this is what sets high effort Vaporwave apart from their middle ground counterparts. The middle ground is more prone to sample overuse, where many creators will sample the same classic pop songs or TV broadcasts, which can lead to listener habituation since this overuse becomes obvious in a genre dependent on samples. So obvious, in fact, that it sometimes becomes a meme, such as the Mallsoft drinking game where people joke about taking a sip every time they hear the audio sample, I'm gonna grab my laptop and put it over here, in a Vaporwave Mallsoft song. This is a great example, and a reminder, to all aspiring Vaporwave artists that you should go touch grass and locally source your mall field recordings instead of ripping them from the internet. Now, it should be noted that this sample overuse effect is not exclusive to Vaporwave, and other electronic music subcultures, most notably from EDM groups like Monster Cat, certainly suffer from this problem as well depending on what tracks you listen to. Getting back to the two albums I mentioned earlier, Chuck Person's Eco Jams and Floral Shop, they both sample songs that Gen Z is not yet old enough to have a real, genuine nostalgia for. The Diana Ross version of It's Your Move was released in 1984, and Baker Street was released in 1978, long before the birth of the first Gen Zers in 1997. While the most popularly sampled songs in Vaporwave tend to come from a similar era, which drags some millennials along for the ride, to Gen Z it has a completely different meaning. If the modern world is stuck in the forever now and isn't inclined to generate new culture for us to be nostalgic over later, then cultural artifacts, such as these old pop songs, are plundered from the past and brought to the present to form Gen Z's pseudo-nostalgia, or as it's better put, their animoia. Animoia is defined as having a nostalgia for a time or place one has never known. If this word sounds odd to you, it's because it was coined fairly recently in 2012 by John Koenig in his project The Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. You see, Vaporwave is hard to explain because it requires a vocabulary of new words such as vaporware, plunder phonics, and animoia to refer to its development and effect on individuals. For example, it's very confusing to many people that Vaporwave is so successful at making Gen Z nostalgic for old pop songs they were never around to hear when they first aired on the radio, but animoia explains this phenomenon perfectly in just one word. Conveniently for us, the explosion of Vaporwave over the last decade provides plenty of different flavors of animoia to choose from. These flavors usually embody the various positive or neutral themes of previous generations and filters them through Gen Z's likeness of categorizing things into small internet subcultures like Dreamcore, Alt Kids, and Pastel Goth, but this time applying it to Vaporwave music subgenres. For instance, Mallsoft is intended to sound like the music heard in malls, sometimes adding reverb and sound effects such as checkout beeps, intercom advertisements, and people moving their laptop over here to commit to the auditory experience. 
Another example is VHS Core, with albums such as News at 11 by Cat System Corp and Atmospheres by Eco Virtual, which emulate the feel of analog television by sampling tidbits of old news broadcasts or mimicking the kinds of songs you would hear on weather channels. Both malls and analog television are things that previous generations might not think much of in hindsight, but are stereotypical and standout themes from savory times that Gen Z was born too late to experience. Themes now made inaccessible by the national traumas we've experienced since then. So, why does Vaporwave have this effect? Aren't music genres a product of the generation they're popular with? Well, that's where things get even more interesting. Generations are getting just as complicated as the concept and functions of Vaporwave itself. The line between Millennial and Gen Z is quite blurred, and while we have institutions like Pew Research defining the particular chronological lines, they don't apply so neatly since the lived experiences between them tend to blend so much, especially because of the cultural Forever Now phenomenon. Like I mentioned earlier, Gen Z lacks a collection of nostalgic memories to rely on as part of a regression-based coping mechanism, and I think this is because a savory nostalgia has become harder to form due to major cultural upsets in American history that shape our sociological environments. This is why Pad Chennington makes vague comments about 9-11 in his video about Vaporwave, because that event changed how America functioned as a country that we grew up in, which in turn shapes the nostalgia we form as individuals. As my favorite Vaporwave artist, Cat System Court, put it in an interview with Pad Chennington, quote, on that day, I think the old world died. You know, that peaceful world. That American dream world. It seems to be the opinion of people old enough to remember 9-11 that, all other conditions notwithstanding, Americans were generally nicer to each other before these events took place. They were less paranoid and protectionist. This theory isn't entirely baseless, and one standout Vaporwave album that drives this point home is the aforementioned News at 11 by Cat System Corp. The first five seconds of this album put intense EDM drops to shame with this powerful sample. Good morning, America. I'm Charles Gibson. I'm Diane Sawyer, and it's Tuesday, September. Yes, my friends, News at 11 portrays the feeling of friendly, carefree, pre-9-11 America Cat System Corp was talking about by sampling news broadcasts from the moments before the attacks in between its songs. How the hell did he get this to work? Firstly, I need to explain why this album can feel initially eerie due to this technique, barring of course that raw introduction I just covered. The way songs suddenly cut out and go silent for a bit to switch to these news broadcast samples primes you to think more critically about the specific things the broadcasters say. Other than that, it's kind of quiet around the country. We like quiet. It's quiet. It's too quiet. Although it's not fall yet, so <laughs> it's still a perfect summer morning. And uh, good advice, hug and earth today. Where are you from? Youngstown, what are you doing here? Just hanging out? Who are you here with? My son. My husband. All right. Your sandwich. These tidbits make you think about how, nowadays, Americans would be paranoid and fussy if a news anchor tried to casually ask them what they were doing as they were out on the town, or how creepy in hindsight it is for someone to comment on how quiet things are. This effect amplifies the underlying feeling older Americans, especially millennials, have about social behavior after 9-11. All of those things we used to do so casually and not think twice about are lost now that this national trauma has made people more paranoid. You can't just say those things and ask those questions anymore. Americans were shocked into a new, arguably less wholesome and nostalgia-inducing form of behavior. Along with these news broadcast samples, the album plays commercials which, on a first listen, feel as if their only function is to contribute to the overall VHS core feel of the album. If we again pay attention to the specific content of the samples, it again makes you think about how these things have changed over time. Commercials used to be simple, unobnoxious, inoffensive, and, let's be real here, really stupid in hindsight. I mean, come on refinance my home mortgage? Why else would the artist include such a specific commercial if not to make you scoff at how obvious that scam is with the knowledge you have after the events of 2008? However, backing up a few steps to see the bigger picture this album is trying to show you reveals the next interesting twist it has in store, and as it keeps oscillating between carefully selected broadcast snippets and smooth weather channel style jazz, it invites you to exist momentarily in a world where the 9-11 attacks never even happened. A place before we had to give up those social niceties we lost to the trauma of that event. The album's progression reverses this sequence of loss, as the jazz washes over the eerie feeling you initially had about the broadcast samples to assist you in committing to the mental roleplay of the alternative timeline it constructs. It's this final effect that made me realize why News at 11 is so special. You don't need to have been alive during the times these broadcasts were sampled from. You don't need to sit down and listen to some old guy tell you about how things used to be. And you don't need to have the most intimate understanding of American history for this album to tell you, through each of its songs, that we lost something after 9-11 and 2008. In fact, you don't even have to be American to have this understanding either. One thing that I haven't mentioned about the artist behind this album is that he's actually Dutch, not American. 
yet he still words how many feel about these events in the J Card liner notes of the cassette release of the album that say, quote, We have not and will never forget about what happened that day. I'd like to think there's a parallel universe where it never happened. News at 11 is that parallel universe. America was shocked by these cultural upsets, and that means something to Gen Zers, as we keep stumbling through cultural upset after cultural upset ourselves. We identify with these things and hold them so close to heart not because 9-11 was our generation's specific loss, but because we are going to feel those same experiences in our lifetimes just as millennials did when they were growing up. I mean, tell me right now that people haven't been acting differently after the cultural upset of the COVID pandemic. You can't. Our bond with millennials is our wanting for the pre-trauma world that could still provide culture and nostalgia, along with our similar disdain for modern dystopia Americana. I think it's important to note that I exist in a very interesting time during this generational blend phenomena, and this might very well explain my fondness for Vaporwave. I was born smack dab in the middle of the generational blur in 2001, and my wanting for the warm fuzzies is based in part on my past experiences. But what makes me the product of this blur is that said experiences aren't as in-depth as that of people who solidly consider themselves millennials, but I'm not a relatively blank slate either as such is the case with newer Gen Z kids. My specific generation of peers is something you could consider a guinea pig generation. We were around to experience the old technology and habits, and watch everyone transition from film to video, from clear sheet projectors to pen touch boards, from video rentals to movie streaming, from dorky internet fandoms to infuriating toxic nonsense. We're not the oldies in this vaporwave story, and we're not the clean slates either. We're the in-betweeners. I was old enough to just barely have memories of the malls I went to and the VHS tapes or old television broadcasts I watched as a kid. I remember going to the video rental store and excitedly looking forward to the next movie I was going to enjoy. VHS tapes were something I could watch for hours on end while my parents tried to get a nap in or wanted to distract me for a while. The CRTs I watched those movies on, hooked plug-and-play games into, and shot at so the dog and duck hunt would stop laughing at me, gave me a vague sense of nostalgia. Just like the magical acronyms VHS and CRT, I also remember a decent bit about my experiences in malls as a kid. My dad would take me to the one closest to our house, which had a Chinese buffet we'd eat at together. The most savory part of those memories, other than the taste of all the fried rice and lo mein I could stomach, was the smooth jazz that would play over the speakers in the restaurant. Based on these nostalgic memories, it wouldn't exactly shock you that my favorite vaporwave vibes are Molesoft and VHS core. There's a reason I can comment on them so extensively in this video essay. They play on the barely present harp strings of memories I have from a simpler time in my life, ones I can be innocently nostalgic for, ones that don't require me to inappropriately romanticize these times since the lack of specific details makes that difficult to do. These deep and freshly unlocked bits of nostalgia come as they are, and are the piece inside of me that bonds with these different flavors of the vaporwave experience to manifest as nostalgia to me personally. Younger and younger people will have a harder time doing this due to their lack of experience in the 90s and 2000s, leaving them as the blank slates who will have a stronger, more baseless animoia than in-betweeners like me. Some would argue that you need to have lost something for vaporwave to make sense. Millennials lost pre-9-11 America, Gen Zers lost pre-COVID America, and similarly in both of these cases, we lost an environment that was capable of feeling nostalgic for. My experience from the transition of bitter loss to soothing nostalgia turns into a bit of a commentary on my later life, the ages I spent after the ones filled with VHS-flavored nostalgia. My initial interactions with Vaporwave were during a time in my life where I was in a deep rut without a job and without proper treatment for my chronic depression. Albums like News at 11 came off as a bit creepy, and the slowed down nature of Vaporwave songs felt as if they were an embodiment of the intense fatigue I experienced as a result of my depression. Was I dying? Is this slow, calm music the sound of decay? It wasn't until after I got a good job and adequate mental health treatment that I can now enjoy this music with a sense of catharsis. One would assume that Vaporwave would uncomfortably remind me of the horrible part in my life which I was first listening to the genre, but the transformation I went through since then enabled me to enjoy it with a different lens that leaves me with the musical equivalent of a relieved sigh, a breath of fresh air. This isn't to say that Vaporwave is entirely about the vibes that it gives to its listeners, but also about how they affect Vaporwave as a genre. It goes both ways. I've mentioned earlier that songs in the Floral Shop album are spelled with Japanese characters, and many artists use Japanese-inspired names, such as Cat System Corp. It's important to note that this wasn't always the case, and Floral Shop specifically was the first album to use Japanese characters in its naming schema. Now, I can certainly make predictions about why the artist made this decision, whether it's because languages with non-Latin writing systems look aesthetically interesting, I mean, keep in mind, Vaporwave artists have tried to reboot this trend by using other such languages and song names and titles, or it could be a straightforward fetishization of Japanese culture. Either way, this phenomenon would have existed in a vacuum, but due to how popular the Weeaboo fandom is here in the West, 
The aesthetic stuck as it slowly became a standard people followed pretty strictly for a while alongside spaced characters so their music would be recognized under the vaporwave genre. Some could claim that this is an example of how weebs ruined yet another thing, but for the sake of this video we'll be generous and call it a reflection of how the popularity of Japanese culture in the Gen Z media sphere rubbed off on one of Gen Z's favorite obscure music genres. The cult aesthetic of vaporwave after this new trend made it more dependent on Japanese words used in song and artist names, sometimes alongside the use of Japanese women on album covers, despite this not being evident of there being any Japanese vocalists in the music. This is, of course, with the exception of one subgenre called Future Funk that relies on samples from vinyl Japanese city pop songs. Despite Gen Z quickly introducing this aspect of Japanese culture into vaporwave, this tends to cause discomfort for Japanese Americans trying to enjoy the genre. This particular vaporwave aesthetic happens to come off to many of them as being a fetishization of Japanese culture, instead of an appreciation. Especially considering that a lot of artists who are using Japanese language and the likeness of Japanese city pop stars' faces in their music are not themselves Japanese. This phenomenon has been considered cultural appropriation by some, since artists who aren't Japanese tend to incorrectly display such a culture as a way to make money off their music by following the cult aesthetic, forgoing accuracy or racial sensitivity for the sake of apathetic profit. Despite this, Vaporwave is certainly not a sham. Its use of samples helps some who listen to Vaporwave music appreciate songs from earlier generations, with many listeners usually asking where samples came from so they can listen to the original song. St. Pepsi's track Pineapple Jr.'s samples Keep Trying by Atkins, and another song of theirs, Behind the Mic, samples a song from Jeremy Jackson called Our Love Story. These tasteful samples give me an appreciation for both the original song and the Vaporwave tracks that sample them. It expands my taste in music, and despite partaking in Vaporwave's nostalgic allure, doesn't force me into an isolated bubble of music subculture, since it gently encourages me to explore a bit. At this point, you might be thinking, Calvin, isn't this all a bit too obscure, with pedantic terms like plunderphonics and animoia and odd samples from the 90s? And listen, a lot of the fun comes from the obscurity and deep lore. If you want to talk about obscure, let me just mention that the first 18 seconds of the song If I Saw You Again from Pages were sampled to create an entire fucking song for the third track on the Floral Shop album, which was called Flower Shop, spelled in Japanese because of course it is, and that Vaporwave song was then chucked into an AI reprimer that spat out a bunch of easily sampleable garbage, which was then used to make the beat of an AI voice rap song, of which the original uploader refuses to release an instrumental for, forcing me, an autistic dork on the internet, to commission a good friend of mine to recreate it in full. Yeah, we all make mistakes in the heat of passion, Jimbo. Moving on, with a music culture as rich as Vaporwave, its cult aesthetic, subgenres, and extensive history, it can certainly leave one wondering, where does it go from here? Obviously, music cultures evolve over time. Disco was only relevant for a relative blip in history, and even music cultures like punk or grunge don't stay the same forever. So, of course, the same must apply to Vaporwave. Now, what I say here is speculation, but Vaporwave plays an interesting role in the lives of people and generations going through vast changes in our societal structure. Vaporwave makes it easy to initially fall prey to the common longing for 90s revivalism, as many who enjoy the genre base these goals, bringing back the 90s, on the romanticized versions of the past that Vaporwave gives at times. But like the tech promises of the early 90s and 2000s, this wanting for 90s revivalism is just another thing that will vaporize. It's unattainable. Some can certainly consider the over-romanticization of nostalgic times in Vaporwave music to be problematic, since it gives people an unrealistic view of the past, which scrubs it of its less savory aspects. However, this is intentional, not just because it helps give Gen Z an animoia to depend on since they're growing up in times that people can no longer be nostalgic over, but consider it like this. When you're at a funeral, you're not meant to be completely honest about the deceased out of respect. You're meant to highlight their better qualities, and as a form of getting proper closure, romanticize your time with them so you can move on. Vaporwave is doing the same thing in terms of the old times. We cannot get people off the alluring hook of 90s revivalism until we give them proper closure to move on. Vaporwave is both that warm feeling of nostalgia for those who have that hole in their soul that needs to be filled with something wholesome, but it's also a mourning of those times so we can move on properly. This still begs the question, what is Vaporwave getting us ready for? What future movement are we preparing for by receiving proper closure now? That future movement is called solar punk. Notice that we're moving away from the wave naming schema, as this is no longer referring to broken promises and vaporizing ideals, but now a new evolution of society entirely. Punk as a naming schema refers to generational future themes, such as steampunk, raypunk, and cassette futurism. Our current reality is cyberpunk, or a world in which our dystopia is highly technologically advanced to the point that it progresses faster than our ability to answer its moral qualms. We can only escape cyberpunk dystopia via vaporwave for so long before we eventually have to change things, 
and that change is solarpunk. Solarpunk isn't a new concept, and neither were many of the concepts that Vaporwave was built on either. Just as Vaporwave played on the feelings of people who needed nostalgia after national upsets that built an environment that was less nostalgia-inducing, Solarpunk plays on the feelings of intense climate anxiety that Gen Z feels, and how they need not just nostalgia, but also hope. Climate change is obviously not the only thing that the new generation has to worry about, but it's symbolic of the rest of the world collapsing. For Vaporwave, the collapse that such a music subculture was mending mostly surrounded the events of both 9-11 and 2008, and how that was symbolic of the breakdown of easygoing, friendly, and wholesome American life. With Solarpunk, that symbol is ecological collapse, and how it represents our limited time in addressing the problems of climate change, fascism, and destructively apathetic economic structures. Vaporwave tells us it's okay to grieve. Solarpunk tells us that a hopeful future is possible. Vaporwave's aesthetic is coated generously in pastel pinks and blues. It samples old pop songs and shows us media and animation from the decades it's rooted in. Meanwhile, Solarpunk has a white, green, and blue color scheme. Its aesthetic is what someone would show you if they were fantasizing about what an ecologically stable society and its associated architecture would look like. Two albums that portray such an aesthetic are Solarpunk A Possible Future and Solarpunk A Brighter Perspective. They're both collab works that were made between many, many different Vaporwave artists, but if you're looking for something more prominent that has a similar sound and hopeful theme, then there's the album Building a Better World, which was a legendary ambient Vaporwave collaboration between Cat System Corp and Telepath, two influential artists in the scene. As much as I'd love to dive deeper into this solar punk category, it's still being developed. Sure, we have a few albums, but the community still needs to decide what to do with it. Will solar punk be a Vaporwave subgenre? When is it a good time to stop mourning the 90s and early 2000s? These are questions that the community will have to decide for themselves just as they decided what other subgenres were worth birthing into existence, such as Signal Wave and Utopian Virtual. Sometimes in this music subculture, things are created and thrown at the wall in hope that things might stick. That's just how experimental electronic music cultures work. Regardless of what the future brings us, music is one of the key driving forces of history and is integral to the culture of each generation that it defines. To Gen Z, it gives a remedy for their vague wanting of a warm and fuzzy time to feel nostalgic over, despite being in a harsh world that doesn't want to give it to them. The march of history requires both a feeling of community and a cathartic culture to push us through the uniquely tough times that characterize the modern American experience.